So we're looking at Genesis chapter 18. The title of my message is Pleading with God. And we're talking about intercession. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the art of intercession. The word intercession comes from a Latin root word, which means to come in between, to come in between. So on one side, you have God, and then on the other side, you have humanity. And to make intercession is to become, is to go between those two, to be, to go in between. And it doesn't necessarily have to be God. It could be a negative circumstance, and then you have yourself. And so to go in between means to step in between whatever it is that you're dealing with on two opposite ends. So if there was somebody that was sick, for instance, right now I'm dealing with a young man that is sick, very sick, and I'm stepping in between this young man who cannot even talk, who's on a ventilator, and I'm going in between and I'm pleading on his behalf before a holy God. I am doing what? I'm making intercession. You have family members you have that don't know the Lord. And you can go in between those family members and God and make intercession and plead their cause before the Lord. You have situations, circumstances, financial difficulties that you can go in between those situations and God and plead your cause. It's almost as if, as if you're, you become a lawyer in that moment and you're representing a client before the judge. And through intercession, we do that. We bring our case before the Lord and we plead it before the Lord. We plead it. And that's what we see here in Genesis chapter 18 where Abraham goes before a city of sin, a city, Sodom, or cities I should say, Sodom and Gomorrah, and goes in and he pleads for the cause of that city. But more specifically for the righteous that are there. And he makes intercession. In fact, Genesis 18 by scholars is known as one of the greatest intercessory stories that we have of the scriptures that come out of the word of God. Genesis 18, Abraham in his intercession. It's a beautiful example of what intercession is. And so we're going to look at a, a, a couple of verses here just to kind of bring you up. To speed here with what we're talking about, we've been talking about praying through the last couple of weeks. We've been in a series on praying through that, not just praying about something, but praying through until there are results. Praying through until there is victory. Praying through until there are, until God brings about a change to a particular situation. And we have seen time and time again in scripture where people have had to do that. Where it's not, sometimes it's not enough just to pray once. And say, okay, I prayed and then that's it. Sometimes you've got to pray through until the answer arrives. Until there is a change. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if there are situations that you're dealing with and that you're confronting and that you're having issues with and you prayed about it and yet you haven't seen the results that you're looking for, don't stop. Keep praying. Keep persisting. Keep believing. Keep standing. And believe God. Just like Elijah who prayed for rain and he kept praying, he prayed in, in a, a birthing position and he was and he it would ask a servant, do you see any rain coming? And the servant six times said, no, nothing. But on that seventh time, he saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand approaching. But you see, Elijah had to pray through until change came. Imagine if he had given up after the second time. Or the third time he prayed. He prayed once. And then he prayed a second. And he prayed a third. And then he prayed a fourth. And he prayed a fifth. And he prayed a sixth. I wonder where in that process where we would have given up. If we were praying for something. Where would we have given up? Would we have given up at two? Or three? Or four? Some of us are notorious. Me included. So I'm not casting stones. Because people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. But we, some of us would have given up after the first time we didn't see any results. But you got to pray. And I got to pray. And we got to pray. Just because we see things going a certain way in this nation doesn't mean that we should stop praying. Because God hears the prayers of the righteous. His face is against everyone that does wickedness, Peter says in the Psalms. But his ears are attentive to the righteous. 
And if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you qualify for righteousness, as we've already seen. But we got to pray. Because why? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. I like the Amplified. It says that it accomplishes that the much power is made. Tremendous power is available to those who through continuous prayer pray. Tremendous power. No, we either believe that or we don't. But we got to pray, friends. And we got to pray and we got to pray until there is change. And I think this is a story here that is a, one of beauty and tragedy. Because on one hand, we see a man interceding for a nation. And unfortunately, that nation or nations perished because judgment had come. But there's a, a beauty in it because at the same time, there was a family that was saved. There was a family that was spared. And I think sometimes we look, we gloss over it. We don't realize that Abraham, he wasn't just interceding for that nation or nation, Sodom and Gomorrah, but he was interceding for his nephew, Lot, and his family. And sometimes we miss that. That it was because of Abraham's prayers that Lot was spared. Amen. And you and I can receive and enjoy the same benefits as well when we pray. So what we see here in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1 it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, there three men stood by him. And when he had saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So he sees these three men. Now, most scholars believe that this was two angels and the Lord himself. I personally believe it was Jesus who came along with two angels, because when you get to verse 22, it actually says in verse 22 that it says that the men turned their faces from there and they went towards, towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So the two men, these were two angels that they went towards Sodom. And actually in chapter 19, verse one, it does say that these were angels. It says the, the angels had approached Sodom. It says, and there came two angels at Sodom. That's Genesis 19, one. But these men came, all three of them, two angels and the Lord had come. And then we know what happened. Abraham fixes them a dinner, has his wife prepare a calf and, or, and the servant to prepare a calf. And he fed them. And the angels, the men, the Lord said to Abraham, where is your wife? Because he was the promised one through whom Isaac would come and ultimately the nation of Israel. He was the blessed one, if you will. And his wife, in her old age, the Lord said, she's going to conceive. She's going to have a child. She is going to conceive. She's going to have a child. She's going to become, the, she's going to become the, a mother. And what happens? What happens? She laughs. She says, am I going to have pleasure in my old age? Everybody look up here. Don't worry about him. <laughs> am, I going to have, am I going to have pleasure in my old age? And she laughs. And the angel says, what are you laughing for? Why is she laughing? And she's like, I, I didn't laugh. She goes, no, and he says, no, no, you did laugh. But listen to the words of the, of the Lord. Listen to what he says to her in verse 14. When she says, am I really going to have an age? Am I really going to be able to bear a child? This is an impossible situation. There's no way in her old age, that she's going to be able to have a child. And this is what the Bible says. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And he tells her at the appointed time, and next year you're going, to, you're going to bear a child. I'm sorry, at the appointed time, I will return unto you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Wow. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Look at, verse, look at that on the screen, verse 14. Back up one verse there. I just want you to your eyes to get fixed on that. Because that is a word for each and every one of us here today. You might be dealing with a very difficult situation that in the natural, it's not possible. The Bible says that the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. Amen. Amen. Because with God, all things are possible. Amen. But you know what God requires? He requires faith. How many times did Jesus go and minister to somebody and he would ask them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? 
According to your faith, be it unto you, he would tell them. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? She didn't even tell Jesus, I need a miracle. She just snuck up behind him and pulled the healing right out of him with her faith. I didn't write that. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. And then when she did it, the Bible says Jesus felt virtue go out of him. He didn't even authorize it. He didn't even say, well, you know, I'll give you this. Heal. No, she snuck it out of him. <laughs> and he said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I felt power go out of me. Who touched me? And his disciples. Oh, Lord, you see the crowd thronging against you. And you can say, who touched me? He said, no, no, no. This was a different kind of a touch. I felt power go out of me. And when he turned and he saw her, you know, she was trembling because she was considered unclean and she could have gotten stoned for being there that day. And the Lord said, don't fear. She, he said, you, the Lord, had, you know, God has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. And when you look at that verse, you look at that passage of scripture where he says, your faith has healed you. What is he saying? Your faith is the reason why you got your miracle today. So when we read a passage that where God says it's anything too hard for the Lord, what we need is faith to, in a big God to do the impossible. And that's what we need. And that's, that's just a side note. Why. That's not even my message. So I just want you to be encouraged that if you're dealing with difficult situations and challenging situations and, you're up, and your back is against the wall, I want you to hear the words of the Lord today in your heart. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I don't care what it is, friends. I know it's easy to, to sit here and quote these scriptures when everything is going well in your life. It's another thing when your back is against the wall and you're sick and you're broke and you don't know what to do. And they're going to come and they're going to take your land. They're going to take your property. And they're going to come and they're going to confiscate your car and all kinds of things. I know. But God wants you to know, is anything too hard for the Lord? Let's have faith, friends. Let's have faith. So I just, a couple of observations, a couple of things that we learn from this story of Abraham, who's pleading with God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis chapter 18. Just a few things that we learn. The first thing that we learn from this story is that God wants to be our friend. Look at verse 16. It says, And the men rose up from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken but the verse that stands out to me the most here is, shall I hide from that thing which I shall do? Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Multiple times in Scripture, the Bible calls Abraham God's friend. And so the Lord was saying to, to the two angels that were there, should, 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 we, should we hide this from him? I mean, Abraham is really our friend. You know, and I know he's going to command his children. I know he's going to raise his children right. We know that he's he's destined to become the father of many nations. So um, I think we should kind of let him in on, on what we're going to do. Don't you think so? And so that that's kind of what's going on here. And this is because of a covenant that he has with his God, with the father. This is because he has a friendship with God that the Lord reveals his plans to his friends. God wants to be our friend. Family, Be Look, Jesus said it this way. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, than, he, than a man lay down his life for his friends. This is what Jesus says. John 15, verse 14. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you. Frank, you're God's friend. You don't feel like God's friend, but you are his friend. God wants you to know that. You're his friend. He calls you his friend. That's beautiful. And friends talk to other friends. And so he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you, whatsoever I command you. And I'm not saying you have to do it perfectly. 
You just have to have a heart that's towards the Lord, a heart that says, God, I want to serve you. I know that I'm flawed. I know that I make mistakes. I know I mess up. I know I don't measure up in my lifestyle. But God says, son, daughter, I know that about you. That's why I sent my son Jesus to, to die for you and to give you his righteousness, to give you my grace to sanctify you, not something that you could do in and of yourself, but what I would do for you. That's what real grace is. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. And God calls you friends. And when you're a friend of God, he will reveal certain things to you. He will walk with you. He will talk with you. He will see this. See, God didn't need to come down to, to Abraham. And tell him what he was going to do. He could have just done it himself. But God manifesting like this. Jesus coming down with two angels. The Lord coming down and manifesting himself. And sharing with Abraham what he's going to do. Was an expression of his friendship. It was an expression of God's friendship with Abraham. He's revealing. He's letting the man in on his plans. And sometimes God will do that. He will sometimes let you in on what he's going to do. God will reveal certain things to you and I. And then there are certain things he will not reveal to you. There are certain things, no matter how close you get to him, he will not reveal them to you. In fact, just as a side note, you don't have to go there, but I'll read it to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. Listen, the secret things belong unto the Lord. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things which God wants to make known to us, he has revealed to us and will reveal to us. But he says the secret things. That means there are certain things that when you ask God, why did this happen? There are certain things he will not reveal. Because the secret things belong unto him. That's why you don't always get an answer to your why. But he says, but the things which have been revealed belong unto us. So there's two paths you can take here. You can either focus on the things that God has revealed to you and will reveal to you. Or you can focus on the things that belong only unto him that he's not going to reveal to you. Sometimes we get caught up on the wrong end of that. Sometimes we get so caught up on God. Why did this happen? Why did you allow this happen? And sometimes that gets in the way of, of serving him. And we get we can become resentful towards the Lord because maybe something happened in your life that should not have happened. And you're wondering, God, why did you let this happen in my life? Why did you allow this? And you don't still don't know the answer to that. You may never know the answer to that. You've got to get away from that and focus on the things that you do know. Focus on what God has revealed, what he will reveal, and what he does reveal to you. And trust me, God knows how to get it over to you. You don't have to be a super Christian. God will find a way to get over to you what you need to know. He's already gotten over to us what we need to know from his word, through his word, by his word, in his word. He's revealed his word unto us. He's given us his spirit and he gives us revelation knowledge through his word. And God uses words of wisdom and words of knowledge and uses prophets and uses you know, people in the church, he uses your friends, he uses people just like you and I. They sometimes share something with you. Sometimes you don't want to hear what they have to share, but he'll do it. But my point is this in all of this, that what I'm talking about on this first point of God wanting to be our friends is that God will reveal to you what you need to know. Because he considers you his friend. God shares his plans with his friends. And that's one of the beauty beautiful things about serving the Lord is that your friendship with God gives you access to him. Your friendship. Just being a mere believer, being a, a, a Christ follower makes you one of his friends. Jesus says, you're my friend. And if you're his friend, you have access. You have access. You can go to God anytime and talk to him. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, what a, an amazing privilege. You can't even get into the CEO's office if you wanted to. But God says, 
I'm the CEO of the universe, and anytime you want to come into my office, come in and talk to me. That's beautiful, friends. I think, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I have access into my father's heavenly office anytime I want, morning, day, and night. He doesn't sleep. I was just reminiscing the other day. I had one of my kids was talking to me, the other one was talking to me, the other one was talking to me at the same time, and my head's doing this. And I said, Lord, there really is a difference between us and you. I said, I don't know how you do it. I said, I can't even focus on two of them at the same time. I said, but you focus on all of us at the same time. How do you do that? That's what makes God God. That's part of God's, you know, omniscience and omnipotence and so on. And God says, you matter to me. You, your voice matters to God. Your voice, your prayers matter. He wants you to pray. He wants you to talk to him. He wants to be your friend. Let's move on. The second observation that this story teaches us is that God is a God of justice. This story really asks the question, God, are you fair? Is God right for judging? Look at verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know it. And the men turned their faces from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Let me just kind of say a few things before we get into the story. Uh, the Lord is coming now to assess the situation. He has heard that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is very grievous. This is a city or cities that have turned themselves away from God. They have given themselves over completely to ungodly sin, to wickedness. And we know that there is the sin of homosexuality here because later we read when the angels were in Lot's house, the men at the door were wanting to break down the door and to rape two angels. That's how it's read. And it got so heated, Lot got so scared that he was willing to give his daughters up so that they would not come after these two angels. And they were saying, bring them out so that we can sleep with them. That's how this city has, and this, is, this is what's going on. And Lot, while he's in the midst of this conversation, the Bible says that, these, that, that the angels pulled him out of that conversation, shut the door and blinded these men. And the Bible says that, that they were, that they could not find the door even in their blindness. They were lusting so bad for these angels that they were scratching at the door in their blindness. That's how far gone this city was. That a society had stooped so low that they had lost control of their physiological condition. And they were lusting, they were fornicating. The Bible says in Peter that, that Lot's righteous soul was vexed every day after day from what he heard and what he saw. There were things that were unspeakable going on in that city. And that's why God said that the cry of this city has come up into my ears. And I have to go and see what's going on down there. And it says, and I'll make it a, a judgment. I'll make an assessment as to what to do. But God was coming all the while. If he finds out that there's iniquity there, he's go, and there's evidence of it, he's going to send fire. It's a cry for justice. You see, friends, sin demands that there's justice. Do you remember Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain? You remember? Yeah. And the Bible says that Abel's blood cries from the ground. What was it crying for? It was crying for justice. Sin always cries for justice. And sin was crying out. There had to be something to be done. God, are you fair? We know God is fair. We know God is just. You see, if God doesn't judge sin, He's not a just God. What judge do you know 
who winks at crime and lets it go by. If he doesn't punish crime, what do we call that judge? An unjust judge. Would you not agree? Well, God is the same way. Sin has to be appeased. It has to be atoned for. There has to be some form of justice. And judgment was going to come. In fact, archaeologists tell us that in outside the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, outside these cities, that they found bodies, 500,000 bodies, neatly stacked on top of each other. Wow. Right outside the city. How could those bodies get there? Because they had to clean out the city after the judgment fell. A graveyard. Half a million people. Judgment comes. Be it ever so slowly, it nonetheless comes. But Abraham begins to intercede. And this is the third thing I want you to see, is that God hears the prayers of his friends. You see, friends, your status, your friendship status with God gives your prayers a platform. Your status with God as his friend gives you a platform for your prayers to be heard. Abraham had a platform for him to be heard. It was called his friendship. It was the covenant that he had with Almighty God. And he had that platform. He, he, God had given him access. And you have that access. I have that access. But listen to this. So Abraham, watch this, in verse 23 it says, And Abraham drew near and said, Will you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? So Abraham brings up the question. He says, God, listen. Are you, are you going to destroy? If there's righteous people in that city. See, he knows Lot is in that city. He knows he's there. So he's asking him, God, would you destroy Lot and his family along with that city? Would you, would you do that? Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Would you just throw them in the same melting pot? Aren't you fair? Aren't you a just God? So he's, he's talking to the Lord. And Abraham says, perhaps there are 50 righteous there in the city. Will you destroy and not spare the place for 50? If there's 50 there? And he says, that, that be far from you to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from you. Listen what Abraham says. Shall not. This is verse 25. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Shall not God do right? The judge of all the earth do right? Isn't God fair? Will God really destroy you along with the wicked? This is why I'm a pre-tribulationist. This is why I believe that the rapture of the church is going to happen before the tribulation. Because the tribulation in the book of Revelation, the great tribulation, is a, is a form of God's judgment. It is God's judgment being poured out upon the wicked for their refusal and rejection of Christ as also a judgment upon Satan. It's being executed. That's the great tribulation. It's God judging the wicked. But before that happens, I believe that 2 Thessalonians has to happen first. That there has to be a catching away of the church. And then that man of lawlessness will be revealed. Who the Lord will destroy with the brightness of his coming at his second coming. You see? So, and that's why Paul says, you know, comfort one another with these words. He says, for we are not appointed unto wrath. He's talking about the tribulation. That's what Paul says. That God's going to rescue his people. Everybody look up here. Get the little guy. Everybody is going to... Um, messing my own words up. I'm saying everybody, look up here, and I'm saying everybody. <laughs> but there's going to come a time where God's going to harp... Pazomai, the Greek word for what scholars say there's no term for a rapture, but really it's, 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 it's there in an implied way because it says that he will catch us up to be with the Lord. And that's the Greek word harpazomai. It's where we get the word harpoon from. The Lord's going to harpoon his people and pull them out. 
And then there's going to be the seven years of tribulation on the earth. But I believe God is not. And why does God do that? Because God does not judge the righteous along with the wicked. And that's what Abraham is doing here. And you see that through scripture. It, it's consistent with God's character. Look at Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 5 and 6 and 7. The Bible says that God got Noah out of there and his family. Noah was a what? A preacher of righteousness. He gets him out of there with his family and then judgment happens. There's the flood. It's just, I mean, it's over and over. Again and again we see this taking place. And here we see God getting is about to get Lot out of this city before judgment comes. And you can read about that in Genesis 19. We're not going to get all the way in there today. So we're just going to make a couple of points on this and then we're going to we're going to close this up. But I just want you to see friends that God hears the prayers of the righteous that your status with God as his friend gives you a platform for your prayers to be heard. And so Abraham asked God, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said in verse 26, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And then we know the story. Let's read it. And Abraham answered and said, behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Perhaps there shall lack five of the 50. Would you destroy it for 45? And the Lord said, If I find there are 40 and five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke unto him again and said, Perhaps there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for 40's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not your Lord be angry, and I will speak. Perhaps there shall be 30 found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me. To speak unto the Lord, perhaps there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy for twenty. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak yet, but this once, perhaps ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten. And the Lord went his way as soon as he left, communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. I love this because you see Abraham and God, the Lord, in this dialogue. They're having this relationship, you see, because they're friends. God didn't have to do that for him. He could have just said, listen, uh, Abraham, you, you really don't know what you're talking about. I think God a whole lot longer than you. I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to wipe him out. But he didn't do that. He has this conversation. Why? Because this is an expression of his love. It's an expression of his friendship. It's an, that's the kind of relationship he has. And it's the same kind of relationship that you and I have with our Lord, with our God, that God calls you his friend, and he calls me his friend, and we can talk to him about anything and everything, that we don't have to be shy about it. And I've heard scholars, I've heard people, you've heard it, well, Abraham should have went all the way down to one. I don't know. I don't know. Because when I read this here, it says that when Abraham got to the 10, it says that the Lord left. The Lord, it was almost as if the Lord didn't let him get down to that one. It says, he, it says, when the Lord finished speaking with him, he left. And Abraham had said, you know, just, just this one time, I just want to ask if there's ten there. Maybe he should have said five or four. <laughs> he would have had his wife and his two daughters. And that would have been it. But this is what I believe. I believe that because Abraham interceded that Lot's family was spared. Lot's family could have been destroyed in that, in that whole mess, that whole situation. Lot's family could have gotten wiped out. In fact, this is what we do know. If you study it out in Acts chapter 19, a part of Lot's family did get wiped out. So nobody talks about that. His sons-in-law. And the angels tried to spare them. Tried to spare the son, sons-in-law. Because the angel said to Lot, whatever family you have here, sons-in-laws and whatever little ones you have, he said, get them out. And so Lot went to his sons-in-law 
and said, you guys got to go. The Lord's going to send fire. He's going to destroy this place. And you know what his sons-in-law said? The Bible says that he thought he was joking. And they got left behind. Those angels grabbed Lot, grabbed his wife's hands and his two daughters and rushed them out of that city. And his sons-in-law were joking around, goofing around. Meanwhile, they could have been, they could have gotten out. I mean, that's 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 tragic. But there in, in that case, yeah, maybe, but they, they had an opportunity to get out. But they didn't make it. But Lot and his family were able to get out. And I believe that because of the intercession of one man who began to question God and began to tell God that you can't destroy the righteous with the wicked. I believe that it's somehow in this dialogue, somehow in this conversation, that the Lord had mercy on Lot and his family and got them out. And got them out of that situation. But God's justice demanded that a society and that a system would be judged. And friends, it is no different today that there is going to come a day when the system that we live in, this world system, will be judged. God did it before he will do it again. He did it in Noah's time and sent a flood upon the earth. He did it with Sodom and Gomorrah and sent fire and brimstone. And the day will come when there will, become, there will be a great tribulation that will come upon the earth. And there will come a time when the earth will burn up with fire and the elements will burn with fervent heat. Judgment always comes, be it ever so slowly. Mockers have said, even in the Bible, it says that they say, where is the coming of the Lord that he promised? And Peter says, oh, it's going to come. What you, the reason he hasn't come yet is because of salvation, long-suffering. God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's going to come, friends. I don't know when, but I'll tell you what, we need to be ready. There's going to come a time when society won't be able to buy or sell anything. Because there will be an antichrist who will force everyone to get a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And they won't be able to sell. And anybody who takes that mark and worships the beast will be cast into the lake of fire, the Bible says. Now, I, there's been so much speculation. Well, what is the mark of the beast? Is it a symbol? It's just a symbol for just following the antichrist. And it's not really a real physical mark. It's just, you know, but that can't be true altogether. That's partly true, but... Because it says that you can't buy or sell without this thing. So it has to be some kind of physical mark. I always keep thinking it's going to be some kind of chip that's going to be implanted somewhere. Which they already have technology for. In fact, I just somebody just sent me something this morning. In Sweden, they're already using it in companies. They take, put a little chip in the hand. And you can watch them on the video on YouTube. And they go like this. And it just opens the doors and the place. And... You can put your credit card information in there, put your bank account information in there. Wow, isn't that real convenient? It's going to come, friends. Now, I personally think that it will be mandated by the Antichrist when millions of Christians disappear from this planet and the government is wondering where did everybody go. And we better, we better put a chip, we better, we better put a mark on them so in case it happens again, uh, we'll be able to track them down. But the Christians will already be gone. That's just what I personally think. I can't prove that out scripturally. But I'll tell you what, if I was in office and I was in a high place of leadership and I woke up one day and millions of people were gone and I didn't know what this was and I'm an unbeliever and I don't know God, I don't know Christ, I don't know what's going on, I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, I, I, I would probably try to see to keep this from happening again. I'd probably put it, you know, make everybody get, I would mandate it. Everybody's going to get this chip so that in case this happens again, we'll be able to track you down. And by the way, you can't sell or buy anything without it. In fact, let's, oh, and this was the thing. When I watched this video, 
They said that, oh, the currency here, you, 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 there, there were no uh, credit cards, there was no cash, they didn't take cash or credit inside their cafe in this company. The only thing that you, all of your credit was on that little chip. All of your, your money was on that chip. So they had no way of taking cash or credit cards. You had to use the chip to buy something. And they would take a scanner and go, like that. And then you read over in Revelation, it talks about that you can't buy or sell without this mark on your hand or on your forehead. You know why they would put it on your forehead? Because if somebody has a prosthetic device, they can't put it in the hand. Maybe. I don't know. So it's, it's, it's one or the other. Anyway, I've gotten way off my message on that. But here's where I, where I want to go with this. And I want to close up here. All right? Because this is the final thing that I want you to see is this. God knows how to rescue the righteous. Amen. He knows how to rescue the righteous. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 9 with me. 2 Peter, and then we're going to close. And that's what we saw what happened with Lot, right? He gets, he gets rescued. 2 Peter chapter four. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. 2 Peter chapter 2, this is what it says. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an, an, an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just Lot, or righteous Lot, who was vexed with the fil filthy conversation or conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly out of trials and temptations, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So you can see right there that Lot was rescued. The Lord rescued him. The Lord knows how to rescue the righteous. And I just want to say this one thing. This is what the Lord has kind of led me in where this whole message was going is this. That Jesus' death acted as our intercession for you and I. That Jesus' death, that his death was a form and, and an act of intercession for us. That when we deserved punishment, it was his blood that interceded for you and I. And it still intercedes to this day. This is why God is not kept pouring out his judgment in the earth right now. Because we are in a dispensation of grace right now. Romans 8.34 says, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Friends, just like Abraham made intercession for that people, and how he made intercession for Lot, how he made that intercession. Friends, it, what is different about that, though, is similar but different. It's similar in that Abraham was making intercession, but it's different in that the blood of Jesus makes intercession now for you and I in this time. And it's Jesus saying, listen, friends, yes, judgment is going to come, but you don't have to be judged. You can be, re you can be welcomed into my arms. You can receive what I have done for you. I have shed my blood for you. I offer you the gift of righteousness right now and receive me as your Lord and as your Savior. Because there's going to come a time when I'm going to when I'm going to fold this thing up and I'm going to rapture my saints and I'm going to call them out of this earth and out of this time. Look at Hebrews 7, 25. It says, wherefore, Jesus is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. God ever lives to make intercession for us. Hebrews 9, 24 says, For Christ entered into heaven itself, not to appear in the now to appear in the presence of God for us. Friends, Jesus entered into heaven with his own blood. He went into the heavenly holy of holies. It was his blood that stepped in between God and humanity and spared us from judgment. And that's why I do not believe God is judging the nations right now. I do not believe this COVID thing 
was sent from God in any way, shape, or form as a judgment. Because we're not in a season of judgment. We're in a season of grace where God is saying, tell people about me. Tell people the good news. Tell them that I died for them. Tell them that I have a plan for them. Tell them that I love them. That my father and I love them. I died for them so that they wouldn't have to be judged. This isn't the same type of situation. It's not the same as it was with Abraham in that day where a whole societies were judged in that one moment. Because Abraham didn't have the blood of Jesus to say, look at what Jesus did. He couldn't step in and intercede and say, here's the blood of Jesus. He didn't have that. But you and I can step in between and say, Father, have mercy upon these people. Have mercy. Jesus, save so-and-so. Save this person. Lord, have mercy. And we can preach the gospel. We can preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And we, have, we are ambassadors for Christ. And we can offer people good news. Amen. 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 Thank you for that holy amen. All right. I got one good amen. <laughs> Friends, it's, it's life and death. You know, I had a, a young man that I went and saw. A victim of a terrible illness. Ready to die. And in that moment, I offered him the gift of salvation. And I don't say that boastfully. I just knew in that moment that the greatest thing that I had to offer this person was Jesus. Amen. It's all I could give him. And he received the Lord as his Lord and Savior in that one moment. And four days later, he was paralyzed on a ventilator. Can't talk. No one move his arm. Going to see him almost every day. To minister to him. To try to give him hope. What is your life? What is my life? We, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. You could walk out of the streets and get hit by a car. That's right. And it will be over like that. You're not promised tomorrow. And Jesus died and bled and paid the ultimate price for you and I so that we could live, so that we could have life in his name. And the Lord reminded me, he said, son, you, because I felt like, Lord, I, you know, this guy is, you know, what have I done for him? What, what, you know, you know, you, you're praying for healing. You don't see it happening the way you want to see it. And the Lord reminded me that he got the greatest gift of all. He got the greatest miracle of all, which was his son. That was the greatest miracle. He said, no matter what happens, you can bank on this, that this young man got the greatest miracle of all, the gift of salvation. And that's the greatest. And that's what you and I are called as ambassadors to bring the gospel the good news to people and say, Jesus died for you. He died in your place. That even if you die physically, yet you will live. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Though a man die, though a person die, though a woman die, yet they shall live. Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he will raise us up at the last day. We will be raised. Stand to your feet. I don't want to go any further. So friends, there's other lessons we can learn from this. Intercede for your neighbors. Intercede for your family. Intercede for those who don't know the Lord. Go before that person and God. And ask God to give them life. Ask God to give your community life. We can go before this nation and ask God to have mercy upon this nation. And say, God... You see what's going on. You see the injustice. You see all that's happening. Lord, have mercy. We don't have to be victims. We don't have to just let things stand as they are. But we can plead with God. 
And we can say, Father, I'm asking you to have mercy. Have mercy upon so and so. Maybe there are friends. I'm sure everybody in here knows somebody that you can pray for. I'm sure there's somebody in here that doesn't know the Lord, that needs to know the Lord. Community, friends, it's our obligation to pray and leave the results to God. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord and you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to offer you or those who might be watching on social media, If you don't know the Lord and you want to know him as Lord and Savior, friends, I cannot say this enough. I cannot emphasize this enough. There is going to come a time when this gospel will not go out anymore. There will come a time when God will say, okay, the full number of Gentiles has come in. Come home. Now, thank God, during those seven years of tribulation, the gospel will still be preached. We know that. The Jewish people will preach it. 144,000 will preach it. But there will come a time in eternity, friends, where it will not, you'll not have that opportunity. If you die today, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. You lose that opportunity. But there will come a time where it will be no more. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, I implore you, receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just pray this with me, friends. Pray it from your heart. This is what the Apostle Paul said, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. For with the heart we believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Pray this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, let's do it all together. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me a sinner. Come into my heart. I believe that Jesus, you rose from the dead. You died for my sins. You rose from the dead. God raised you up. I confess you now as my Lord, as my Savior. I repent of my sins. I turn to you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these, your sheep. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity. Lord, we ask today, God, that, Lord, that we will not take this message lightly, but that, Father, that we will be true intercessors who plead your cause. And we thank you, Father, that as your friends, that, are, that we have a platform to pray and intercede. And Father, we ask even now, Lord, upon this great nation, that you would have mercy. And that, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of the people back to you, O God. While there, there is time in this dispensation, God, we pray that you will raise up laborers to go forth into the harvest field. To send, Father, those, Lord, with the, the gospel. To send us, Lord, your people, Lord, into the highways and byways. To share the good news of the kingdom of God. We pray. That many will be saved. Many will be, Lord, will turn from wickedness and turn to you, O oh God. And we pray, Lord, for this great nation. That we will turn back to you, O oh God. For you said in your word of my people, which are called by my name, will repent and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. Then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so, God, for even those who have not turned, we repent on their behalf. We ask for mercy and we ask that you would heal our land. We ask that you have your way. Lord, let no person leave the same way they came today. Father, I ask now that you bless your people. Make your face shine upon them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them shalom and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, family. You are dismissed. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless.